I hope tonight's sermon is interesting for you guys. It is back on the topic of the Trinity, but uh, I, I wanted to preach about um, Isaiah 9 6. Isaiah 9 6. So the title of my sermon is The Everlasting Father, and I've underlined the because I feel like this is the word, you know, when, when Orthodox Trinitarians are trying to explain Isaiah 9 6, this is really the word they're trying to get away from. So it is a sermon just about this passage, but the reason why I'm just, it, the reason why I'm preaching this sermon is because this topic is just kind of fresh on my mind because I've talked to a lot of people. And um, I, what, the, the point of the sermon today is just to give you the other points of view to this passage. Because I, I feel like I've heard just about every explanation of this passage, you know, besides the one that, that was commonly known before. And um, I just want to go through them with you and explain why I don't accept them. And then that'll give you a good idea of, of what people are talking about in this passage and how they're trying to get around it. Now, keep in mind, I have, I have uh, obviously my view on Isaiah 9, 6, and then I have five other explanations. So there, there's five different explanations that I've heard on Isaiah 9, 6 uh, that are not the same position as I have, which is just believing what it actually, what I believe it actually says. So there's five different explanations. But what I want you to keep in mind is what's interesting about these five different explanations is that, you know, a year ago, before all this went down, nobody had these explanations. You know what I mean? There weren't all these explanations for Isaiah 9, 6. Everybody believed the same thing, that he was called the Everlasting Father because in some way or another, he was the Everlasting Father. And then when all this Trinity stuff went down, now there's all these other explanations. Now, not only that, a year ago, none of these explanations exist amongst independent fundamental Baptists. But the other thing is, it's ironic that some of the explanations or some of the positions now on Isaiah 9, 6 are, are, are explanations from those that do deny the Trinity, right? They do deny the deity of Christ because the way Jehovah's Witnesses and the way Mormons would understand Isaiah 9, 6 is now how it's being explained. So I just feel that that's a little um, odd. It's a little ironic, really, because they're saying, they, they're coming up with an explanation because they believe the Orthodox Trinity and yet the people that deny the deity of Christ and deny the Orthodox Trinity have the same explanation for passages like this. Um, so let's go into So Isaiah 9, 6. What does it say? It says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So that's why I got the title of my sermon, is because one of the things that Jesus Christ is called is the everlasting father now my position if you, i'm sure you guys all know what my position is on the trinity is that there's there's a, there's a paradoxical truth about the trinity right that there is three and one at the same time and i explain it similar to how you know jesus uh, is both 100 percent man and 100 percent god and that's why sometimes when you're talking to a jehovah's witness or you're talking to a mormon you know oftentimes they'll go to the passages where jesus is man to try and prove that he's not god and, and it's not that you deny those passages because you accept that Jesus is 100% man. But then what they avoid is the passages that, that teach that he's 100% God. And they're, they're the ones that they can't answer. So that's the same sort of paradox and confusion there when you talk to a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon. When you're trying to say Jesus is God, they take you to all the passages where Jesus is man. And you're not really denying it because you do believe Jesus is man as well. But it's just that you believe he's also God at the same time. Now, one thing about this position, right, with uh, Isaiah 9, 6, where you just believe that, you know, Jesus is called the everlasting father. He's called the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. Um, and it's a paradox because he is at the same time. So, yes, Jesus is the son of God, the word manifest in the flesh. But at the same time, he's the everlasting father. He's God the father because these three are one. This is this paradox. And, you know, I really do kind of miss the days because I miss the days when everyone could peacefully, peacefully just believe that and not be called, you know, a modalist or a oneness, you know, not be slandered against and railed on. Um, and, and it's funny because it, it seems like the only person that's allowed to believe it, like we, used, like we all believed it back then, is Roger Jimenez. Yeah. Yeah. Roger Jimenez is the only one, he's the only one, yeah. he's the only one that's allowed to believe it and anyone under his umbrella. They're allowed to believe that and not get slandered and railed, but everybody else if they believe that Isaiah 9, 6 teaches that Jesus is the everlasting father, um, gets railed against. So what's the paradox? I believe the paradox is shown here in John 1, right? John 1, in the beginning was the word, 
Look at this. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, I've always understood John 1 as a paradox. In a sense, like, how can something be with something and yet be that something at the same time? And that's how I understand God, that God has three that are with each other, but at the same time, all three are one, right? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. So Jesus, is Jesus the Son? Yes, he's the Word made flesh, but he's also God, right? He's also God the Father, because he's with God the Father, but he also is God the Father at the same time. And this is what's paradoxical about it, just like he's man and he's God, He's not God the Father in one sense because he's distinct from God the Father, but at the same time, they're one, so he is. Now, I don't, I don't know exactly how that hangs together. And this is why people have different explanations, different understandings, different ways they might try and wrap their head around that. Um, and just like, you know, great is the mystery of godliness, that God was manifest in the flesh. How do, we, how do we hang these two concepts together that a man who didn't know everything at the same time knows everything? You know, a man that, you know, was all powerful, but at the same time, you know, you needed strength. You know, you knew you needed to learn. You know, it's just, we don't know. That, that's, that's how we don't know how these hang together and, and people have different explanations of how that works. Here's a few verses I want to go through that I haven't really, because I, I don't want to just go over the same verses that I've been before. I'm trying to show you guys some new things. So in 1 Corinthians 8, this is one that gets repeated again and again, showing that uh, we, we worship one God, and that God that we worship is the Father, right? In 1 Corinthians 8, verse 4, I want to show you here, if you read the couple of verses just before it, it says uh, here in verse 4, As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one, right? So we believe that there is one God. We're not polytheistic. We don't believe in multiple gods. We believe that there is one God, and that one God is being contrasted to idols, right? False gods. So whilst a lot of people believe in multiple gods or false gods, the one God we worship is contrasted to those idols. Look at this. For, for, though, there be, for though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, right? So there's a lot of false gods or there's a lot of you know, other lords that are not the true Lord or the true God. So you see how there it's being contrasted with the multiplicity of gods, the multiplicity of idols with the one God that we worship. And then you get to verse 6, it says, but, unto, but to us there is but one God. Right? So it's not talking about one of the persons within that trinity. Right? It's the one God that we worship that's being contrasted to the idols and the false gods. But that one God that we worship, it says, but to us there is but one God, the Father. So that one God that we worship is God the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Now when I read passages like this, when it just mentions God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, which is the Son of God, don't you ever think, why doesn't the Spirit ever get mentioned? You know, why is the, why is the Spirit always like the red-headed stepchild that only sometimes gets mentioned? So, you know, I, I think it's because that these passages, you know, I, I, I would think it makes more sense that these passages are distinguishing between the word manifest in the flesh and God the Father, right? As opposed to a distinction here between the first and second person. Because when, when people always take these passages as distinctions between the first and second person, and I do think those exist, right? Because you have passages where it's, you know, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost. See, that is, you know, the three persons within the Trinity. Or you have, you know, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. You know, there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. So there is verses that allude to the three persons. But when I see passages that only allude to the two, to me, I think more so of the distinction between humanity and deity, because that distinction exists as well. So, because otherwise I'm always wondering, like, why, why? That's why a lot of people, the Holy Spirit to them is a bit of a mystery, because he's sort of like always there, but then... He's not really always talked about. It's always, you know, God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. God the Father, God the Son. Even when you read through 1 John 5, there's a lot of, you know, God and his Son, and then the Spirit's mentioned every now and then. But it, it, that's always the two that come together, uh, more often than not. So this is where we see there is one God. He's the Father, 
right? So if Jesus is God, he must be the Father as well. I'm going to go into some of those a bit later on as I get into the different answers. Colossians 2 says here, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, right? So we can get spoiled by traditions that get passed down from man rather than seeing what we believe from the, from the scriptures. After the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. Look at this. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So yes, do we believe that Jesus is the Word made flesh? But at the same time, he's not just the Word. Because remember, the Word was with God, but the Word was God as well. So even though, yes, we believe Jesus is the Word made flesh, at the same time, the fullness of the Godhead dwells in Jesus. What's the fullness of the Godhead? The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. So you can't completely detach these two concepts. And this is one thing I'm trying to explain to people in this whole Trinity controversy, is if you only go to one side, you're going to get into error because you can't just say there are only three or there's only one. They need to both come together. The scripture always brings them back. So the people that say, well, Jesus Christ is only the second person, he's only the word of God, but the word was God as well. And in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So I don't think you can fully detach Jesus from the Father and from the Holy Spirit. Um, here's one that uh, uh, Tim Coleman brought up uh, that, I, that I posted in the group, but I just wanted to bring it up because I just thought it was so interesting. If you, if you didn't listen to that video clip and get what he was saying, I'm just going to explain it to you now, just the way this paradox works where Jesus is the Son of God, but at the same time, he's, he's God the Father. So they're distinct, but at the same time, they're the one person. Look at what uh, is happening here in Acts 13 when the apostle here is preaching. Uh, I believe it's Paul preaching here in Acts 13. <clears throat> he says here in verse 33, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second Psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Now I have a different thought on uh, you know, what this is talking about here, and thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, but I might preach it another time. Um, I, I don't necessarily think that the thou my son this day have I begotten me is talking about the resurrection. I think here it is talking about us as well in the fact that we are begotten of God as well as Jesus was begotten of God when he was born. Um, so it says here, Jesus has fulfilled the same unto us their children in that he had raised up Jesus again as it is also written in the second half, thou my son this day have I begotten me. So who's saying that? That's, saying, that's God the Father saying, right, to, to, to the son, saying thou art my son this day have I begotten me. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption. So now there's another verse here being raised or in, in regards to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He said on this wide, so who said, Thou art my son this day have I begotten thee? God the Father. So he's going to say again, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Right? So God the Father is saying, Thou art my son this day have I begotten thee. Then he says, I will give you the sure mercies of David. And then in verse 35, it says, Wherefore he saith also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Now what's interesting about that last one is that one is actually said by the son who went to hell, right? To die for our sins. So if you go to Psalms 2-7, Isaiah 55-3, where we see, I will declare the decree, the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Right? So that's come from top down. Right, He's talking to the son, saying, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, he's saying here, he's talking about the resurrection in Isaiah 55, 3. Climb your ear, come unto me here, and your soul shall live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. So that was the, the, the verse 34 there. He said on this wise, I will give you the sure, sure mercies of David. Then when we get to Psalm 16, verse 10, we know... Peter also preached this. I don't have this in my notes, but Peter also preached this in Acts 2, where he's talking about, this is how we know Jesus Christ went to hell and rose again for our sins because of Psalm 16 and Peter preaching it on the day of Pentecost, saying, hey, this is actually referring to Christ's soul, that his soul was not left in hell. So he says here, for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, right? When Jesus Christ descended into hell to pay for, my, pay for our sins, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Right, so this is now the Son of God in hell saying to the Father, you're not going to suffer your Holy One, which is him in hell, to see corruption. Right, because he's, not, he's saying this is not talking about David because David did fall asleep and see corruption if you read the rest of the passage. But see what it says in Acts 13. It's saying 
Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And then in verse 30, 34, the same person that said that said, I will give you the sure mercies of David. And then in verse 35, it says, Wherefore he saith also, the same person that said, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Begotten thee. The same person said, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Now that's not a paradox. I don't know what is. right? Where the person that's being spoken to is saying that it's the same person as the one speaking back. Right? So this is where God is, he's outside of our understanding. That's why there's, there's no problem with God being a paradox because at the same time, God manifests in the flesh is a paradox too. This is why I don't have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with the paradox. So that's my position, just a few verses on that, showing that there's a paradox there. And like I said, that's the position that was believed by everyone in this movement, you know, over a year ago before this all went down. And um, now there's different explanations. So let's go through these different explanations. I've got five different explanations. I'll try to blow through them as quick as I can. So the first one I've got is that Isaiah 9, 6 is just saying, even though it says he's the everlasting, uh, he shall be called the everlasting father, they'll say, well, it's just saying that he's just God. You know, it's, it's just saying that even though he says he's the everlasting father, that's just another way to say that he's just God as well. Now, the reason why I don't accept that is because in Isaiah 9, 6, it already says that. Right, it already says that he's the mighty God. You know, he shall be called the mighty God. So why would then the everlasting father be a reference to him just being God as an essence or God as a divine attribute when that's already stated, right? The mighty God. And now it's the everlasting father. So obviously something different to what's being uh, said about the mighty God. Now, I've heard an analogy for the Trinity uh, where people will say, you know, God is, is a bit like a, like a church where we are one church but there's multiple persons within this church. Now, I have a problem with an analogy that says that God is like a church in the sense that we're all part of this church, but there are multiple people. Because to me, I don't see how that, and if God is like that only, right? And he's not, and, and you know, he's multiple persons within a church, but we're not also each other, right? In a sense, I don't, I don't see how that's not polytheism. Do you know what I mean? Like, if, if that's how God is, if God is just this, you know, just a divine, like, it's like being in this church is just a divine essence. But all of us are different. We're never each other. If we're never each other, I don't know how that isn't polytheism, because that's what polytheism is. It's when you have, you know, like, if you think of the Greek gods and the Roman gods, it's just multiple persons that are, have all a divine essence, but they're never each other. That's where I think God is different, because the three that are within the Godhead are each other as well, and that's why it's still only one God, right? Even though there are three persons within that one person. So I don't know how, I, I don't know, I, I've never heard an explanation because, it, because when, you, when you talk to people, you know, ab about the Orthodox Trinity, they, they, never, they never explain to you how they're one. They always go on about how they're three and how they're three, but I've ne yet to hear an explanation. Like, when do these three ever come together for you to say that there's one God? You know, and I had a conversation with somebody recently where I, I said to them, you know, when you worship God, do you, do you think of like one person that you're talking to? One like person when you say, you know, thou, you know, you know, and people sometimes pray in King James and they'll say thou art holy to thee and things like that. And you're talking to one person. I said, do you see him as one person or are you praying to a group of three people? And he said, no, he sees it as a group of three people. So that just kind of blew my mind because I mean, when I talk to God, I, I'm thinking of one person. Yeah but I just don't know how this one person is three persons. Yeah, so it's, but, 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 like the, but the one person is there. It's not like he's never one person. He just always exists as, as, a, as a group of three. Um, so I, I thought that was a, a little bit weird. So let's say, for example, you know, the analogy of God being a church and there's multiple persons within a church. So when you say, because then you'd say, I worship God, right? So if somebody was to use the analogy of a church and there's multiple people within the church and church is just the essence that's bringing us all together to say that we're one. If I say I worship the church, you know, in that, in that saying, and I'm not saying, I, I, obviously I don't say, somebody's probably got to take that and make it into a clip, right? <laughs> if I say I worship the church, it's like, what am, what am I worshipping? What is that? What is, you know, am I worshipping this kind of nebulous organisation that's just something that ties us all together? You know, like, what, what is it? Because like, I can't, because am I worshipping, I'm worshipping the individuals, you know, but if I say I'm worshipping, like, one God, what is that thing? And, and even if somebody uses that explanation to say, well, it's just saying that there's God because they're both God, 
and therefore it can say he's the everlasting father, but they're not each other. Uh, you know, then the question is, then the church analogy wouldn't work, right? Because I, I can't just be called anybody else within the church. You can't just say, well, Victor shall be called the Lewis. You know, Victor shall be called the Nathan. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because we're never each other. So, this, so that's why it's funny that, uh, you know, when you talk to people that believe in the Orthodox Trinity and they start giving you analogies, but they always say this, right? They always say, no analogy is perfect. <laughs> right? So they, so they have this, it's like, hey, this is how it works, body, soul, and spirit. But then they say, oh, yeah, but that's never perfect. Why? Because body, soul, and spirit is one person. So you can't use that. And then and the body's never the spirit. So you can't have a verse that says, well, the body shall be called the spirit when, when the, that doesn't work. So, it's funny how they're saying, oh yeah, we've just got it all down. This is how you have to believe it. But then every way they explain it is it's never perfect. So this is why I feel like in, in all these Orthodox Trinitarian sermons you listen to, they, they, I feel like they never really explain how God is one. I, I don't know if you guys get the same feeling. I feel like, you know, I listen to all these people try and explain to me, you know, sometimes I've gone back and forth with some people about the Trinity. And they go on about how they're three, but the moment you try and pin them down to say, well, how is that one God? If they're never each other, how do you have one Saviour? How do you have one Lord? How do you have one, one God? It's like, well, they don't know. That's where they throw their hands up. Yeah. So then it's, well, then, okay, well, that's, the, 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 you don't have an explanation. So <clears throat> I think it's very clear. We, we, we are monotheists. You know, we believe that there is one God, and I believe it's right to think that God's nature is a paradox in the sense that there are three, but the three come together at, as one in one point because we only believe that there's one God. Uh, Deuteronomy 6, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Jesus repeats this in Mark 12. Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one one lord ephesians 4 you know there is one body and one spirit even as you're called in one hope of your calling one lord one faith one baptism one god and father of all who is above all and through all and in you all i always find verse 6 interesting because it's almost like they're they're the attributes of father word holy ghost right there's one god and father all who is above all right so the father's ruling and reigning in heaven and through all, because through, by, by, through the word of God and through Jesus Christ, all things were done. And in you all, because the Holy Spirit dwells in us. But yet this is saying that one God who is father of all is doing those three things too. Uh, so we definitely believe that there is one God. And that's how I would show the paradox. And I'm not going, sort of going all into that sermon, but I want to explain a few other things to you today. So that's how I see it as a paradox. Now, some people would say, well, no, no, the Trinity is not a paradox. What it is, it's that there are three persons that are one God, right? And they say it's not that it's three equals one, it's three A equals one B, because there are three persons that are, that are one God. These two are two different things. Now, the reason why this doesn't work is because most Orthodox Trinitarians are not partial, partialists. And what is, a, what is partialism? Partialism is when you believe that the three must come together to be God. So the Father is one third of God, the Son is one third of God, and the Spirit is another third of God. And you need all three of them together to be God. Now, nobody, I don't know anybody that believes partialism because there's a, there's a problem with partialism because partialism means that Jesus is not God on his own. Right? The Holy Spirit on his own is not God because none of them are fully God. Yet they believe... The Father is 100% God, you know, the Son is 100% God, and the Spirit is 100% God. So they're not partialists. So, but you can't represent that position with 3a equals 1b in mathematics because 3a equals 1b, if you know your algebra, right, a is one third of b. Yeah. Right? So, so the Orthodox Trinity can't be described by 3a equals 1b because that's a description of partialism. Right? Where the, the a is only one third of b and you need three a's to make up that b. Now, this is, a, this is a quote from the Athanasian Creed, and this is really where Orthodox Trini Trinitarians go to sort of, you know, say, hey, this was the creed that really describes, you know, the nature of God and the Trinity and all that sort of thing. One of the paragraphs in the Athanasius, uh, Athanasian Creed, so this was a guy by Athanasius um, back in the early centuries. I don't know all the exact numbers, but I just hear this being referenced all the time. I had to read through it. This is one of the paragraphs. It says, thus the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, Yet there are not three gods, there is but one God, 
right? So that's the whole Father's 100% God, Son is 100% God, the Holy Spirit is 100% God, yet there are not three gods, right? So there's not multiple gods, there's but one God. Now, I would agree with that statement. So this is how they would see it, right? They would see, well, the Father's 100% God, the Son's 100% God, the Holy, the Holy Ghost is 100% God, and they are that God which is 100% God too. Now, what I've tried to explain to some Orthodox Trinitarians is, you have a paradox too. It's not, that I, it's not that I'm the only one that has a paradox. You know, when I say three equals one is a paradox and that describes the nature of God, and Orthodox Trinitarians say, well, no, 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 we're not, we don't have a paradox because 3a equals 1b. Yeah, well, unless you're a partialist, you know, you have a paradox too, right? Because each of those a's is 100% what that b is, like I've represented in this picture, right? 100% God. So you see how there's 300% on the left? And there's 100% on the right, that's 3 equals 1, right? That, now you're back to this, 3a equals 1a, right? Because each of them are God, and they're all that 100% God that's on the, the other side. And if you know your algebra, that's going to get it back to here, right? Because you're going to get rid of the two a's. And they're going to take, take each other away, divide each other. So you're back to 3 equals 1. So they, they have no problem with this. This is the Athanasian Creed that says the Father's God, the Son is God, the Holy Ghost is God, yet there are no, they're not three gods, they're all one God. So notice that the same term on the left is the term that's on the right. But if you do this, the Father's a person, the Son's a person, and the Holy Ghost is a person, and it's all that one person that's God, all of a sudden you're a heretic. So it's like, this is, this is your heretic, your oneness, you know, you're probably a homosexual, this is like, you're a man of God, you know, you're teaching right doctrine. And I was just thinking like, uh, okay, so you're, you're allowed to use every other term on either side of the equation. And if you read the Athanasian Creed, it's like that. You know, the, you'll say like, Father's God, Son's God, Holy Spirit's God, one God. Father's Almighty, Son's Almighty, uh, Holy Spirit's Almighty, there's one Almighty. You know, Father's Lord, Son is Lord, Holy Ghost is Lord, there's one Lord. But the moment you use persons, just because that's the distinction Athanasius made in his creed, that they're one essence, three persons, then, then all of a sudden, it, now it's oneness. You know? But to me, it, that's why, when I, when I talk to people that have believe in the Orthodox Trinity, it's like, no, you don't, it's not like you believing in the Orthodox Trinity gets you away from this paradox, because you still have to somehow figure out or explain why three people that are never each other, are, it's still you worshiping one God. You know? And then but they don't. So I give them the, oh, the benefit of that. I'm not, not going to call them a polytheist in the sense that I don't believe they believe in polytheism because they do profess that they are only one God. It's just they never offer any explanations for why it's not polytheism. You know, why it isn't. Because they, they, they just, you know, because like I said, the paradox is still there. I, I just know, I just understand that it's a paradox. They, just, I, I just feel they're not willing to see the paradox that is there. Now this is the other one where we talked about we believe that there's only one God. And this math equation came up, you know, in some of the sermons that you might have listened to where, you know, they, they were going back and forth. And, and the logic here is, well, if A equals B, right, and B equals C, therefore, that's what those three dots mean. You might hear that as ergo as well. That's like the, the fancy Latin phrase for just therefore, right? So, so therefore, A must equal C. Now, that, that would make sense, right? But then they would say, well... Let's, let's, let's put that to the equation with, with the Trinity, where the Father is God and the Son is God, and then they're saying, well, we're saying, well, therefore, the Father is the Son, right? Because they're both God, and therefore, they're the Son. Now, the counter to that is, well, they'll say, well, don't you know, it's because they're, it's the Orthodox Trinity, right? That God is just a, a term that applies to all three of them. So they'll say things, well, you wouldn't say something like this. You wouldn't say, you know, just like the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, they're all in nature God, just like if it was me and Simon. We're both in nature a human being. So you can't say, well, if Victor's a human and Simon's a human, therefore Victor's Simon. Because right? that, that wouldn't make sense. Right? So you see how that's how they counter it. Because they, oh, it's not just the Father who's God. The Son's God too, and the Holy Spirit's God. Right? So therefore you can't just say, well, the Father's God and the Holy Spirit's God and Jesus is God, therefore they're each other. Because it's like saying, well, I'm a human, Simon's a human, but I'm not Simon. Now, the, the problem I found, I, I felt like the glaring thing that was missing from this conversation that I feel like nobody pointed out is this line of condition, right? Because if Victor is human and Simon is human, but if there is only one human that exists, right, I must be Simon. 
Do you see that? Like, because that's what makes the difference. Because if I'm a human being, and Simon's a human being, and, and we profess, well, if there's only one human being that exists, I must be Simon, right? And that's how I feel it's with God. That's what I feel was missing. It's like, yeah, the Father's God, the Son is God, but there is only one God. So you can't just say, yeah, but they're not the only one that's God. It's a, you know, but you don't believe in three gods. There's only one God. Yeah. Now, if there's only one God, therefore, the Father must be the Son. Because if he's not, and they never come together, if the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost never come together, how, is, how, do, you, how do you make these three gods one God? Exactly. Right? So... This is, this is why, I mean, I, I've yet to get an explanation. You know, I, I feel like I, I, I can't, I, you know, everyone I talk to, the, you, you, it's like you bring them to the point where you're, they're about to see the paradox or about to see it, and then they're just like, well, it's just a mystery. Yeah. And it's like, all right, okay, it's fine. So that's where I feel that there's, there's a logic there. I mean, that, that first point took a long time, so I might have to do the second one. I might only get through a few of these. Now, the second one is in Isaiah 9, 6, that, it's just the name of God in general. Like God just has general terms. And, you know, there's just general names that all of them share, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are each other. So they'll say something like, well, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called. Now I've just underlined child is born and his name because I think it's very clear in Isaiah 9, 6, we're just talking about one person. Like it's very clear that this passage is about the one that's born, right? And his name, so it's, it's talking about this one person. So how you can go from, well, now these names just apply to everybody, you know, all three persons within the Trinity, when the passage itself is saying, no, 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 there's, there's a child that's born, right? There's Jesus. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So not, my first point is, if it's just a name of God in general, then that's, that's not even what the verse says. Right? So you're making the verse say that because you want it to, to fit you know, the Orthodox Trinity. But if you were to just take this verse for what it says, I mean, it, it, doesn't, say, it doesn't mention the other two, right? Unless it's being, you know, it's being mentioned, obviously, that Jesus is the everlasting Father. But the focus here is the child that is born and what his name is. The other thing is, if you look up all these phrases in the Bible, the only one that really is applied to anybody else is the mighty God. If you look up the mighty God in the Bible, you'll see that the, you know, Jehovah is referenced as the mighty God and things like that. But the Spirit's never referred to as the mighty God. And then the other names, you know, what, what verse is there to go to to show that the others are ever named Wonderful, Counselor, you know, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace? So I feel like it's a position that is founded on just imposing a view on this passage that can't actually be used from the passage itself to just to just explain it away, to just say, yeah, well, it's just because everyone can be called these things, but that doesn't make them. So that's one thing. Now, if all of the terms can be applied to all three, you've got another problem now, because if this is just a general term for God, the general terms used for God can be applied to all three. But if one of the names is the mighty God, I mean, do you have three that are named the mighty God now? Because the mighty God is a unique attribute right it's a unique name in the sense that it has the the mighty god so if it applies to all three do you have three the mighty gods now do you have three the everlasting fathers do you have three the prince of peace again as well what what sense would it make to have a name that generally applies to god and applies therefore by you know implication to all three of them of something that you're not Right? Like, I'm called the Everlasting Father, but I'm not the Everlasting Father. You know, I'm not, the, I'm not even an ever, uh, Everlasting Father. I'm not even the Everlasting Father. So I, I think of it like this. It's, it's like if I said, you know, Simon, you know, that's, that's my favorite child. You know, he's like, he's like a number one. And then you say, well, what about Sarah? Yeah, it's like, yeah, she's my favorite child too. And what about Timothy? It's like, yep, he's my favorite child. And you kind of think like, it doesn't even matter anymore what, what that, because what does it matter if he's the everlasting father when there's multiple of them? You know, or the mighty God when there's multiple of them, the Prince of Peace. I mean, he's not a the anymore. And I just think it's the same thing when people say, well, it's my favorite child. What does that matter when, when they're all my favorite child? <laughs> you know, it's, what, does it, what does it matter to me? What does it mean now to be your favorite child if everyone's your favorite child? 
Uh, let's go to Isaiah 43. I'm trying to give you some thoughts here. Isaiah 43, verse 10. It says, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant, uh, whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Saviour. Now, this passage, I feel, doesn't, doesn't fit the Orthodox Trinity. Why? Because, think about this, right? If, who, who is talking here? If in the passage he's saying, I, me, my, right? You can't say that whoever's talking here is just one person within the Trinity, right? Why? Because he's saying, there's no other God beside me. So if only the Son is talking, the Son can't say that. The Son can't say there's no other God beside me. The Spirit can't say there's no other God beside me, right? The, the Father can't say there's no other God beside me. Why? Because the, the, there is other gods beside them, the Son and the, and the Spirit. So it must be here, it must be God, who they would believe is that essence, that overarching essence that they all are. He's the one that can say there's no other God beside me and there's, beside me there is no Saviour. But then that would prove that whatever that essence is that overarches them is a person. Because he's saying, I, me, my, I am the Lord. Beside me, there is no savior. So I'm not sure how they, they get away from that, you know, in terms of, you know, believing that, uh, that there's just a name of God in general when you don't have any really other passage to go to to show that these names apply to anybody else and the passage itself is talking about the Son. And if the names are unique, then what does that even mean when it applies to all three of them, you know? Um, and I feel like the Isaiah 43 would be an issue for that. So I don't accept that explanation. I don't accept that it's just the name of God in general. Now, another explanation I've heard, and this one's a bit more complex. I may not get to all these. But one is, well, in Isaiah 93, the reason why he's called the everlasting father is because he came in the spirit and power of his father. So I don't know if you've heard this argument, but the argument, it basically goes like this, right? In Malachi 4.5, the Bible says, Behold, I will send Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So there's a prophecy that Elijah will be sent before Jesus Christ. And it is a bit of a dual prophecy, right? Because he comes before Jesus Christ comes the first time and he's also going to come you know, in the end times as well, you know, as one of the two witnesses. Then we read in Luke 1.17, it says, And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So who is this talking about now in Luke 1.17? It's John the Baptist. So John the Baptist was actually the fulfillment of Malachi 4.5, where Malachi 4.5 says, hey, he's going to send Elijah the prophet. And we realize that John the Baptist was actually sent in the spirit and power of Elias and fulfilled that prophecy. Now, when Jesus is talking about John the Baptist, he says here in Matthew 11:10, For this is he of whom, I, whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. So that's another prophecy of John the Baptist coming. Verily I say unto you, Among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you will receive it, look at this. This is Elias, which was for to come. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. So Jesus is saying, hey, he's confirming to them that John the Baptist is the fulfillment of Elijah coming, right? And then they say, well, the reason why he can be called Elijah is because he came in the spirit and power of Elijah, even though he wasn't Elijah. John 1, it says here, and this is the record of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Art thou Elias? So they're asking John the Baptist, hey, are you Elijah, which was for to come? He, he said, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, no. So the argument here is that he's called Elias, even though he isn't actually the person of Elias, and it's because he came in the spirit and power of Elijah, and he didn't know, he didn't even, he denied that he was Elijah. Now, they say, well, Jesus is the same, right? So in Luke 4, 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, 
to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. So this is showing that Jesus did come in the spirit of his father. And again, he came in his father's name, right? In his father's authority. I'm come in my father's name and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. So hopefully you get the, the, the logic here is they're saying that, well, Jesus can be called the everlasting father, just like John the Baptist was called Elijah. He wasn't actually Elijah. He just came in the spirit and power of Elijah. Therefore, he can be called him even though he's not, right? And they're saying that same thing applies to Jesus. He can be called the everlasting father because he came in the spirit and power of his father, even though he's not actually the person of the father. Now, there's a few issues I find with this. The first one is, I find it a little bit inconsistent that the only phrase in Isaiah 9, 6, the everlasting father, that's the only one they're trying to say is that Jesus is called these things, but he's not actually that thing. Because mm -hmm. right? in, in Isaiah 9, 6, everything that Jesus is called, he is. Right? Is he called wonderful? Why? Because he is wonderful. He is counselor. He is the mighty God. He is the Prince of Peace. But when it comes to the Everlasting Father, now all of a sudden it's something he's called, but he's not. So that's why I have a problem with that argument because basically they're saying, well, you're called something, but you're not. The other thing to consider is some people actually believe that John the Baptist is Elijah. Right? Some, some people actually believe that John the Baptist was Elijah and he just didn't know it. Right? He came in the spirit and power of Elijah, but he was given a new body. And there are different sort of explanations for that. I'm not all familiar with all the explanations, but the point is, if John the Baptist was actually Elijah and just didn't know it, then that argument falls apart as well, right? Because that means he is actually the person that he's called, right? Came in the spirit of power. So that's why I have a problem with that one. <clears throat> so some people will say, well, you know, when they, when they go to Isaiah 9, 6, and you say, well, that, the verse doesn't say that he is the everlasting father. It just says he shall be called the everlasting father. Now, obviously, I'm willing to concede that point because, yeah, that is what it says. It says he shall be called the everlasting father. It doesn't just say that he is the everlasting father. But I just find it funny that they think that's an argument to get them away from the fact. Because if, you, if you're going to say, start saying things like that, I feel like it gets dangerous. Because if he's just called something that he isn't, you don't apply, like I said, you don't apply that same reasoning to the other things in the passage. Because if you're going to say he's called the everlasting father, but he isn't, then is he just called the mighty God, but he isn't? You know, is he just called the prince of peace, but he isn't? You know, is he just called, you know, why is it only the everlasting father that, 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 is, that is being taken out of the picture here? So, why is the everlasting father the only thing on that list that Jesus is called, but he isn't? Um, or people will say like, yeah, but these, these are not things that he actually is. These are just attributes or titles. And this is where they start getting into the Jehovah's Witness arguments, right? Where they where try and explain away as Isaiah 6 and saying, well, this is not actually things that he is. These are just attributes of Jesus, but, he, but he's not actually those. And my question to Jehovah's Witnesses is always, what sense does it make if an attribute of me is the mighty God when I'm not the mighty God? Like, why is that an attribute? Why do I have the title, the mighty God? It's like, it's like okay, you know, people want to be called pastor so-and-so. I prefer not being called pastor so-and-so. But let's say people went by a title. It's like, the title I want to go by now is the mighty God, Tay. It's like, I'm not actually the mighty God. It's just a title, you know, because, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, in, I'm made in the image of God, you know, I have the Holy Spirit's dwelling in me. So now, obviously that doesn't make sense at all, right? To say that you have a title that's the mighty God or a title that's the everlasting father, but you're not actually those things. And again, if John the Baptist was actually Elijah, which some people do um, actually argue for, then that would, that would not fit it either. Now let's go, I only have five, so I'll, I'll try and get through these last four. I'll breeze through the verses and kind of just give you the arguments. <clears throat> now, number four is that Jesus, he's the everlasting father, but he's not the everlasting father, he's just an everlasting father. And obviously, the, the, the next two, the next two uh, explanations I'm going to give you that try and explain away Isaiah 9, 6, that's really the word that, that really stumps them, right? Is the word the. Because once you make Jesus just another everlasting father, that's not what the verse says. Right? The verse says he's the everlasting father. He's the mighty God because there's one God. He's the everlasting father because there's one God. He's the prince of peace because there's only one prince of peace. Right? So they can't just have an explanation that just makes, them, makes him an everlasting father 
because now he's no longer the everlasting father. So what's an explanation here? They'll say, well, we're born again from the word of God. So in a way, he is our father because we're not just born of the father, right? We're born of the spirit. We're born of the word, right? Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So they'll say, well, Jesus is in a sense our spiritual father. He's just kind of like another everlasting father. You know, he, there's God the Father who's, a, who's an everlasting father and there's Jesus as well who's an everlasting father. So the question is, who's, who's the everlasting father then if, if everyone's just an everlasting father? So the argument kind of goes like that and then it's, they'll say, well, the reason why I have a problem with Jesus being just another everlasting father, just another spiritual father to us is because Jesus says very clearly, he says, call no man your father upon the earth for one is your father, which is in heaven. We can only have one spiritual father. You know, this is why it's wrong. This is why we don't call people father so-and-so. You know, you never call me father Tay. Because I'm not, I'm not your spiritual father. Do you know what I mean? I'm just, a bit, I'm just an overseer in this church. I'm an sh under-shepherd to the, the people of God. But I'm not a spiritual father. That's why these denominations, like, I think it's like the Methodists, and the Catholics and the Orthodox, they all go by that title father so-and-so remember father prokoros <laughs> so they go by these titles but the bible clearly says no 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 there's no spiritual father now how do they justify it right they go to first corinthians 4 14 it says i write not these things to shame you but as my beloved sons i warn you so this is Pete, uh, uh, the apostle paul speaking or writing to the corinthian church saying hey you're like my beloved sons as my beloved sons i warn you for though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. So the way they interpret that passage is to say, well, you do have more than one spiritual father because the person that gets you saved, right? The person that gives you the gospel, they're like your spiritual father. Like Paul is saying here, hey, you don't have many fathers. As though Paul is saying that, he's saying, hey, I've begotten you through the gospel. I am your spiritual father, right? Like, uh, you know, as though he's another spiritual father. Now, not so quick, right? Because is that what Paul is saying here? Because you can read this as, well, as my beloved sons, I warn you, you have not many fathers for in Christ, because Christ is that one father. And then he says, I have begotten you through the gospel. So we assume here because Paul is male, when he thinks about begetting somebody in the gospel, that he's the father in that spiritual begetting of a child. But when we look at other passages, is it true that Paul saw here himself as the husband of the parents of that spiritual child or did he see himself as the mother of that child so he says this about onesimus as well i beseech thee for my son onesimus who i have begotten in my bond so it is true that when we get somebody say when we give them the gospel we are bringing forth spiritual children right but who's the father in that relationship well look at what paul says here in galatians 4 19 he says my little children look at this of whom i travail in birth until Christ be formed in you. Now, if Paul saw himself as the spiritual father, what is he doing travailing in birth? Yep. Right? I, I don't remember when I travailed in birth, the last time I gave birth, like, you know, I, never, I didn't give birth to my last five children, so that's so why I've never travailed in birth. But when you travail in birth, it's because you're the mother. You're the mother of the child. And that's how we, you know, one thing we can learn from this passage is that it takes hard work to get somebody saved. You know, sometimes people just go soul winning and they just like sort of half-hearted do it. They're, they're, they're not, their heart's not really there. They may, they may go once and then never go again. They just think, ah, oh, you know, nobody's getting saved. It's like, you know, is that, is that the attitude women go into pregnancy? No, no. Like, they, no, it's going to be a lot of hard work birthing this child. And that's the same attitude we have to go in with when we go and preach the gospel. We have to be willing to travail in birth to get these people saved, right? And this is what... Um, Paul is saying here, he's, why is he saying, I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you? Because he was worried that the Galatians that he had gotten saved were not actually saved, right? Because they were starting to believe work salvation, right? So he's like saying, now he's like trying to convince them again that, hey, it's just salvation by grace. And he feels like he's travailing in birth again. First Peter 2, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if so be that you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. So you see how when we preach the word to the church, we're feeding them with milk, right? You're feeding them with milk and with strong drink. Now, who feeds milk to the baby? It's not me. It's not the father, right? It's the mother. It's the mother that gives suck to the child. And he says here in 1 Corinthians 3, I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, 
even as unto babes in Christ. Look at this. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you are not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. So when he's dealing with the babes in Christ that he won to Christ, he's saying, I'm feeding them with milk to help them to grow. First Thessalonians 2, but we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So yeah, see how he's dealing with babes in Christ. He sees himself as the spiritual mother who beget them. And then, you know, he's, he's feeding them with milk. So I think there's a problem here trying to justify that Jesus is just another spiritual father. Number one, the verse doesn't say that. The verse says he's the everlasting father. If you just make him another everlasting father, there's a problem because, you know, there's only one father. We only have call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father, which is in heaven. So if they're not each other as well at the same time, then you've got two fathers which are in heaven because Jesus is in heaven, right? No man hath ascended up to heaven, but the Son of Man which came down from heaven, um, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. That's John 3, 13. All right, let's go to the last one. I'll try and cover this one as well really quick. So the last one, the last explanation is that the everlasting Father doesn't refer to um, just the fact that he's God the Father or he's our spiritual Father, but it refers to the fact that he's just like a founding Father, like he's a, like a founder, an author, or a creator. You, know, you might have heard this explanation as well. So it's, it's kind of like how somebody is, is like a, the founding father of, you know, uh, of a country or he's the father of, you know, people say he's the father of modern medicine and things like that. So it's, just, it's not that he's your spiritual father in the sense that he begat you. It's just that he started, he was the first one to start something. Now already there's a problem because if it's just the everlasting father, then that means there's only one that started whatever it is that he's the father of. <coughs> But the explanation is, is this, that he's a founder or he's a author or he's a creator. So we see here, I think, again, the problem is the word the that they have to try and get away from. Now, how is it reasoned from, from the scriptures, from their point of view? I think it's the same in, in the sense that how Abraham is a father of us. He's a father of our faith. Right? Because he was the one that the promise was given to. Abraham believed God and was counted to him for righteousness. So he's the father of faith. He's not our spiritual father in the sense that Abraham didn't beget us. So Abraham, in Romans 4.16, is called a father. We see here that Satan is the father of lies. I'm not reading through all these passages, but you know, when he speaketh the lie, he speaketh of his own. For he is a liar and the father of it. Genesis 4, this is another passage they go to where he says, in verse 20, it says he's the father of such as dwell in tents and of such as have cattle. So he's not just everybody that he fathered is the only ones that have cattle and dwell in tents. Uh, you know, I'd agree with that, that he's, I mean, he's the one that started it all, maybe taught everybody how to dwell in tents and how to, to herd cattle. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all such as handle the harp and the organ. So this is a guy that then probably taught and got people to, to, to play musical instruments and things like that. And Zillah, she also bare Tubal Cain, an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron, and the sister of Tubal Cain was Naamah. So they'll say, oh, Jesus is like the same. He's a father of certain things because it says here, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation. So it's like, hey, see, Jesus is an everlasting father because he fathered a concept. He was a founder of something. Or they'll say that he created things as well. Now, the problem with that is, like I said in Isaiah 9, 6, is the word the, because there can only be one, the everlasting father. So whatever that is, whatever that person is the father of, whatever that concept is, there can only be one that is the father of it, because if there's multiple, then you're no longer the father of it. You're a father of that concept, right? So if it's the everlasting father, there can't be another person that has authored eternal salvation. But according to God's nature, is there another person, you know, according to the Orthodox Trinity, is there another person that has authored salvation? Yes, right? Because God the Father authored salvation too. He's the one that set the plan in place. That's why Jesus says things like this. He says, for I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, right? So it wasn't his, it, you know, they would say, this is how they would interpret it, right? They would say, well, it's not, wasn't his will to come. It was the will of the Father, but the will of him that sent me. 
This is how they understand the Garden of Gethsemane, right? Because it wasn't Je Jesus' will was, you know, is there, is there another way that this, that this can happen? Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Why? Because he's acknowledging that it was the Father's will. It was the Father that sent the Son to be the Saviour of the world. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So you see how it's not just Jesus who's the only author of eternal salvation, because the Father also is the one that wanted to do it too, right? He's the one that sent the Son. And the way the Orthodox Trinitarians understand it is that, you know, Jesus is just doing the will of the Father, right? So who came up with that plan? Who foreordained that the Lamb would be slain uh, from the foundation of the world? Look what Jesus says here. Then said Jesus unto them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, right? So he's talking about dying for us. Then shall ye know that I am he. Look at this. And that I do nothing of myself. Right? So how can he say this if he's the author of, of eternal salvation? Well, it's because there's a paradox there where he's not, right? But yet at the same time he is. But as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. Right? So the other thing is, well, it's not just he's an author, or maybe he's a creator, but there's still problems here, you know, in terms of being able to hold that position consistently. Colossians 1.16, we learn that Jesus did create all things, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him, and for him amen and amen jesus christ created all things why because he is that god that created all things so they'll say well that's why he's a father just because he created everything now if he's a father because he created everything what makes him the everlasting father when he's not the only one that created all things if we go to revelation 4 we see here that the one that's sitting on the throne in revelation is also somebody who created all things, right? And when those beasts give glory and honor, and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne. So remember we sang that song, Crown Here with Many Crowns? This is where that comes from, right? Because the, the elders that are worshipping the one sitting on the throne are casting their crowns at him, right? Casting down their golden crowns around the crystal sea. He says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honour and power. For, look at this. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. So you might say, oh yeah, well, that's easy. Because if Jesus created all things, then Jesus is the one on the throne. Right? And you say, well, that, that reconciles it. Well, but you can't do that if you're an Orthodox Trinitarian. Right? You, can't, you can't reconcile it that way. Now, now you have to have two people that created all things for them and by them. Why? Because when you read over to Revelation 5, and we see here, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain. Now who's the lamb? Jesus Christ. Having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. And look at this. And he came, who? The lamb, and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. So this is where you have a problem now, because they have to make the one sitting on the throne the father, because it can't be the son. Because the son is the lamb in Revelation. But if the one sitting on the throne is the father, and he created all things, now Jesus can't be the everlasting father because he created all things, because now there's a second person who also created all things. So now he's just, he's not the everlasting father. And now again, he's just an everlasting father of eternal salvation. He's not the everlasting father. Because like I said, the Orthodox Trinity, they never come together. You know, when, we, when you understand the Orthodox Trinity, there are three persons within the Godhead and they are never each other. Now, if they are never each other, that's why they're forced to conclude there are multiple Jehovah's. There are three saviors. All of them are saviors. All of them are light. All of the, you know, you know I, that's why I don't know how they get around this paradox because then they end up drawing conclusions that I believe are in error. So anyway, that gets to the end of my, end of my sermon. So I hope that gives you some good information. I know this was more of a, 
you know, objection, debunking sermon. So I know I, I, I went to the different scriptures just to give you those explanations to give you a better idea of the discussion that's been happening around this passage. And hopefully that gives you a better understanding of why I believe Isaiah 9, 6 the way it is. Now, one thing, I will just end on a few points. But one thing that people say is they think that this paradox of the Trinity, that Jesus is the Father and not the Father at the same time, <coughs> you'll, hear, you'll hear people say things like, well, Isaiah 9, 6 is like the James 2 of this whole position, as though there's only one passage to go to. Now, obviously, there's a lot of discussion around Isaiah 9, 6 because it is one of the clearest passages. It's the one they struggle with the most. But when it comes to James 2, faith without works is dead, I mean, there is a good explanation for faith without works is dead without getting away from grace salvation. So they'll say things like that, that Isaiah 9, 6 is like the James 2, but it's like, no, 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 no. There's, there's plenty of other verses to go to to show this overlap, to show things that you can't explain. There's not just one verse that is being disputed in this whole discussion. And I, I, what I find funny as well, that they, they try and say, you know, that, that, that this is the only verse that there is tackle, even though we know there isn't. But yet when it comes to what you say when you baptize, they have no problem that there's only one verse that says baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, right? So they have a problem with people saying, oh, you know, you've only got one verse. And then you turn it on them and say, well, if you say Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, you literally only have one verse. Uh, but, but they're fine with that. They're fine with being dogmatic about that position with only having one verse. So all of a sudden, a literal single verse doesn't, doesn't phase them at all. But the, re the other reason why I don't think it's a problem where they say, well, you know, it can't, the, 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 the nature of God can't be a paradox because it's like salvation. They'll say, well, salvation can't be by works and it can't be by faith at the same time. Now, the reason why I think it's different is because they're right. Salvation can't be by faith, uh, by grace and by works at the same time. But it's not, but, but the reason why it can't be is number one, because we can't do both. And the other thing is the Bible actually says it can't be both. Right, so if the Bible says it can't be both, then you can't, you can't have an explanation that says both are true when, when you're going against Scripture. Right, so it says in Romans 11.6, if by grace, then it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. Right, so you can't have a paradox of salvation by grace and by works because the Bible tells us it's not a paradox. But when it comes to the nature of God, can we have a paradox of there are three that are one. Yes, why? Because the Bible actually says that these three are one, right? For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So it's not like there's this paradox that is just unfounded on Scripture. It's what I believe the Scripture is actually showing us, that there is this paradox. And like I said, the paradox of the three being one at the same time is the same as God being 100% man and 100% God. This is another paradox that is in the Bible. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. That is a great mystery. How God came to this place, took on flesh, died, was buried, rose again. You know, how, how did, you know, like when we read about Jesus' life, he grew in grace. He grew in knowledge. I mean, how, how does that make sense? How is that not a paradox? How does an all-knowing God come and then has to learn things, right? And that's why I have no problem if God is three and one at the same time. You know, it doesn't go against Scripture. It lines up with Scripture. And it's not the same as the whole James 2 argument that it can't be by grace and by works. All right, let's pray. All right, thank you, Lord. Uh, I pray that you know, this sermon was edifying, that people learned some things and they found it interesting. They, they learned some of the counter-arguments. And um, I pray, Lord, that uh, you'd help them to, uh, to always go about issues like this, Lord, that we would not be ignorant of the other point of view so that we can sharpen each other, Lord, and we can have positions that we can not only proclaim with boldness, but also, Lord, that we can defend and know why we believe what we believe. So thank you, Lord, uh, for your word. I, I pray uh, that you'll continue to teach us and, and, and bless the rest of the time together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.